Dobar dan i dobrodošli na balkon. <laughs> Ovo predavanje će biti vezano za fraktalnu geometriju i programiranje u javi, a cijelo predavanje ćemo održati na engleskom jeziku. Um, fractal geometry and programming in Java. Today, just for you. Uh, we are going to uh, begin in a second. Okay. <laughs> oh, once again, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Fractal Geometry and Programming in Java. I'm going to give you an introduction to chaos theory and uh, complexity, a new kind of science. Uh, that has been ruling the world since 70s of the 20th century. Uh, then we'll move on to the exploration of video feedback fractals and the program that I'm currently developing. Um, so, uh, chaos. Chaos is a mixture of randomness irregularity and regularity. Nature is chaotic. It is both ordered and disordered in time and space. Chaos alongside symmetry is the key to its beauty, novelty and wonder. Chaos is produced in deterministic processes of nature, such as the calculation of the logistic map. Uh, here we see the logistic map or the logistic equation. It's an iterative equation that begins with a fixed value of parameter r and x0. Um, a logistic map is deterministic because it always produces the same result for the given input. If we repeatedly calculate the new result by using the previous result, we can obtain ordered or overall chaotic behavior. So here we can see a plot of this uh, map or equation uh, over time. In uh, one aspect it is ordered because all, val all the values, output values, fall on onto this parabolic curve. However, if we uh, if we consider its uh, time series or the signal that it is outputting, we can see that it is unpredictable or random. So for certain parameter r and initial value of x0, the logistic map produces chaotic results. The signal that you see... I'm so sorry. <laughs> For certain parameter r and initial value of x0, the, the logistic map produces chaotic results. The signal that you see plotted below never repeats itself. And yet it is, exhibits some degree of order since all the values fall onto this parabolic curve. At the high school they teach us to analyze this sort of uh, equation as a parabolic uh, uh, curve uh, in an analytic sense it is a quadratic e equation but uh, when we use it as an iterative equation it's actually the source of endless novelty and chaos. Uh, uh, well is there any rule to it or any, um, any uh, law? Well yes, um, the mathematicians proved that uh, any infinite loop uh, such as this one, the iteration that calculates a map in discrete time steps or a system of continuous differential equations in three dimensions can exhibit chaos. Here in the background we, we can see the famous flame fractals. They're fantastic for simulating turbulence and they're very quick, fast to draw. Um, Basically, uh, I want to go back just for a second and try to explain to you one small thing. So, if we interrupt this calculation and restart it, 
it will produce the same result again. So is it chaotic or not? Yes, it is chaotic and it is random. It's just that it repeats itself if we restart it. But if we interrupt it and attempt to restart it by reinserting the value of x, it will not continue as before because it is very sensitive to all the number decimals contained within the parameter x. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, variable x. So, uh, in uh, essence, it is sensitive to all the decimals that we use to calculate this logistic map. And due to this sensitivity, it cannot continue as before. This is called, called the, the uh, sensitivity to initial conditions, and it is the source of uh, chaoticity or randomness. Um, let's continue. Um, novel definitions of system are necessary. Um, chaos theory can give us new perspective on nature. What seems like exchange of input-output information between living organisms and nature becomes a single equation. We may view living organisms and nature as a single equation or a single system. Organisms acquire information, respond in non-linear fashion, and attain unity with the natural world. In the background here, uh, we see a metabolic map of human organism that shows different pathways between genes, enzymes, and metabolites, demonstrating that a drug used to target one gene may have several different effects and consequences on other pathways. Um, emergence. emergence is how complex things develop over time by starting from only the fundamental law of nature, depicted here as a particle process diagram. Chaotic signal could be the source of ideas that evolution can refine. So, um, we are now going to uh, move to another lecture, somebody else's lecture, at the TED conference and see the famous physicist, Murray Gell-Mann, Nobel winning physicist, speak about emergence. They follow from the fundamental theory. They are what we call emergent properties. You don't need, you don't need something more to get something more. That's what emergence means. Life can emerge from physics and chemistry, plus a lot of accidents. Uh, the human mind can arise from neurobiology and a lot of accidents. Uh, the way uh, the chemical bond arises from physics and certain accidents. Okay, so what was uh, Mark Gellman trying to say? He's a, he's a physicist, you know, and uh, uh, his view on nature is that uh, the nature is in essence quantum mechanical, which means that it, uh, it rests on uh, probabilistic nature of uh, elementary particle interactions. But we know that even uh, macroscopic systems that are deterministic are capable of producing randomness and chaos. And nature is in fact unpredictable and is capable of producing uh, very interesting behavior and very rich landscapes. So let's see, where were we? <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. This is a complicated. I can see it. Hmm. How odd this is.
So let us return now to the maps or equations that we saw, uh, in particular the logistic map. Different parameters and variables can be visualized and th these visualizations represent the origin of very, very interesting images and graphs that, that, have, that possess great artistic value. Um, <laughs> I would just like to mention that uh, briefly that Mari Gelman, the physicist that you saw, is the, fo the founder of Santa Fe Institute for Complexity Research. Now, uh, we can test how many iterations are required to reach a limit of some kind. Colors shown here represent these numbers. The most famous chaotic landscapes that you see here are Julia fractals. Uh, they arise from testing each individual point of the plane. We test a coordinate as input parameter in a map equation and iterate it to see how fast the given map reaches the limit we have set. The colors are assigned to the coordinates according to the number of cycles that it takes to reach that limit. So, uh, in a few simple steps, or perhaps I should say in a single equation, we generate complex landscapes that, reminds, uh, that remind us of uh, lands landscapes that we can see on the planet Earth. So here's a forest that uh, has certain fractal properties or certain curliness, uh, intricacy of details, complexity, as well as self-similarity, where self-similarity means that the branches are dividing into smaller branches and so, and so forth. Uh, all forests can be conceptualized through a single simple model using fractal geometry. Um, maps. Maps are essentially equations that input a coordinate and uh, map it to somewhere else, or shall we say, move it to, to another location. So they're morphing the plane in which we find uh, some, perhaps, image. And rays of light which refract through the water are, uh, uh, are uh, a good example of uh, mapping. Perhaps uh, it's too complicated. Um, sometimes it's uh, simpler to demonstrate the mapping with a lens, simple lens, but uh, here uh, an example will do uh, with water as well. Um, so uh, let us see what it means to map something. Here we have a complex function f, f of z equals z, where z is a complex number which denotes a coordinate. And if we take this image as a plane and map it onto itself, we'd get the same exact image as the original. However, if we map it with the map minus z, we get something that, that seems to have uh, flipped sides or uh, reversed sides. So if we apply another map to a ge geometric image, the inverse of z, we obtain a very complicated and interesting image. Um, since this is a course in computer programming, you should be aware that there are far too many um, Balkan flyers around this image, which indicates the, that the computer is uh, reusing the same uh, Balkan flyer to fill the plane up to infinity, because a single poster or a flyer, as we call it, is not sufficient to cover the whole plane and to uh, engage the viewer in this uh, visual transformation or uh, beauty, as we say. Well, now let us briefly jump to our uh, other interface. Hmm. 
and let's take a look at my program, which uh, uses this sort of transformations to generate fractals. So we shall start here. Um, <laughs> geometric transformations are uh, applied here. Some call them image morphing. Some call them conformal transformations. Uh, when we repeat any transformation several times to the same image, we produce very interesting fractal images. And repeating the transformation, geometric transformation, is also known as recursion. In this video, we see more than one transformation, more than one map equation whose parameters are continuously changing. And here we, ha we have some uh, works from a photographer, Mohammad Dumiri. These are the mosques in uh, Iran. Um, they are uh, also transformed uh, conformally with special lenses, uh, kind of lenses that we cannot afford except if we do programming. Um, very similar to fractal worlds. Perhaps it's an art form that uh, has uh, been present for centuries or thousands of years um, around here. So um, these image transformations that I been mentioning are uh, discussed in a variety of ways and this variety is preventing us from learning and finding information online because mathematicians are using different kinds of phrases to denote uh, geometric transformations. So there are conformal image mapping, projections, projection maps, image morphing and you cannot even discuss it with mathematicians unless you pick a math mathematician who studied it in a certain way. Um, well, now we'll move on. Um, we have a little bit uh, uh, of, um, um, well, uh, I'm not sure how to de describe. We have a really complicated uh, presentation mode here. Oh, no. Uh, 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 um. Yes, we shall have a look at this here art. Uh, so uh, I'm going to now move on to the classical video feedback art. Video feedback art has been present for around 100 years and it's the source of fractals as well uh, that are uh, that are, uh, occurring when we point the camera at the TV screen. Um, and this is a situation in which um, in which uh, the image is transformed many times recursively. So uh, let's look at some of the works from the local artists who use this technique today. The following is a brief demonstration of my specific explorations in video feedback. It starts with a video projector on a white wall this camera is wired to the projector and then pointed at the same surface as the projector. The result is a video feedback loop. Every change in the angle, zoom, or other settings of the camera is replicated in the image many-fold. These kinds of effects were discovered soon after video became readily available. Now here's a group from uh, Europe whom I met a few years ago at this very place. They had their performance. They wired the graphics adapter back to itself and used OpenGL uh, to transform a visual image. And this is a video feedback uh, in a different kind of way. Uh, the one that does not really include a camera or the screen, just the graphics adapter telco systems performed at the Video Medea festival. 
And this is an art form uh, that uses a conventional camera, screen and a mirror. What you see right here is the mirror image. You can test these things using a separate uh, webcam and your computer screen. So, uh, for all those who are interested in uh, learning more about these linear transformations, the so-called linear geometric transformations, they can visit this cell web link down below. And what you see on this image is a TV set positioned in the corner made of mirrors. And it is quite difficult to grasp what is what in this image, but uh, uh, it's, it's, it's the case. It, it is, uh, what, what, what we're uh, producing is a kind of a fractal tree that has this uh, bluish look because of the light amplification, repeated light amplification through the video feedback loop. Um, okay, I want to illustrate you more um, about these linear transformations. I'll see if I can. Um, the linear transformations uh, occur when we, uh, for example, uh, mirror an image. So this axis here serves as a, as, a, as a source of a geometric transformation and this axis here also serves to produce more fractals. The, the, uh, the linear transformations are really easy to define and here it only takes three, uh, three uh, pieces of data the position of these three points. All right. So let's move on to my program, um, Perceptron. Um, you will notice that it, it has some degree of similarity to other video feedback programs. And uh, here is the... Here's how it looks in, in nice color. Oh, colors, yes, it's black and white. This is the default setting. It is the source of video feedback fractals and it's currently unique in the whole wild, wide world. So, I'm going to show you a little bit of what I recorded in it before coming here. Um, so here we have a, a persistent um, banner or a title more in the world than meets the eye and uh, the geometric transformation in question is simply the mapping Z combined with some other maps for special effects. This is a series of different videos, short, connected. It can input a live uh, video stream from the internet or from a webcam and the only stream that I can input right now is the CNN International, uh, which is because I do not really have any internet television subscription. So you will forgive me for presenting you the CNN news, but uh, uh, this is all uh, live imagery in a sense that uh, uh, these animations were created in real time. This is real-time uh, uh, graphics, and uh, it is the, the program itself is designed in Java. The latest version is, has been compiled in Java version 8.
here we see that Perceptron can uh, input uh, the Facebook stream and uh, display it for me. Um, the recording is perhaps not so uh, good because it is compressed, highly compressed. This is uh, the development environment, IntelliJ IDEA, Community Edition. So how does Perceptron work? Well, we're going to uh, hurry up with the <laughs> these explanations. So it's a program written in Java language for Java platform. It's a virtual computer that runs on all operating systems. Right now it has been tested in three operating systems. It began in 2007 as a sort of a, a student college work by Michael Rule, and uh, I continued some four years ago uh, thereof. Uh, um, I've been studying it for two years and writing it for another two years. It's currently hosted at SourceForge.net. Um, Perceptron is a Java Swing application, which means that it uses Swing library to display windows. Uh, right now, uh, Java FX will probably replace Swing, but Swing will continue to be updated. Uh, it's, it's a new kind of w new way to display windows and stuff. P Perception renders buffered images using graphics 2D object directly into a J-frame, but with graphics translation methods to fit the image inside the window. And it is possible to use uh, OpenGL alternatives for graphics, and of them all, only JMonkey is amazing. Everything else is uh, silly. And JMonkey is uh, absolutely phenomenal. Um, um, so I'm trying to position this slide in here. Uh, OK, so um, Perception uses a graphics 2D object. And uh, it's an active rendering application that uh, is similar to the that is similar to the game uh, engines or game games as programs, and uh, as such, it has an infinite loop that runs in a separate processing thread apart from the Swing's event dispatching thread, which updates the window contents. So uh, you need to run all the window components uh, using the inv invoke later method. But the active rendering loop is run separately. And that does not always work perfectly. So we use a small hack to prevent dialog problems in Windows by making the main class extend JFrame class. So the whole program begins with this sort of wood voodoo statement. Um, and. Uh, Throughout the years, the only difference between Windows and Linux was in the backslashes, in the way you denote paths to files. But now there is uh, uh, there are more differences uh, this year. Uh, so OpenJava for Linux is more resilient to code that breaks the conventions of how you run different threads and stuff. It's resilient and faster. Uh, Open Java exhibits unexpected behavior when taking screen snapshots and it's, it works faster than the time it takes grabber window to hide itself. A mysterious property that is probably some kind of a bug. Um, Open Java for Linux is faster than Oracle Java for, for Windows, perhaps due to OS response to high quality graphics settings such as these. Uh, those are the so-called rendering hints if anyone is here interested in programming J Java at all. Uh, Oracle Java for Windows has a terrible bug in it. It uh, runs at lowest CPU utilization level with some versions of HTI, Radeon graphics drivers. So there could be companies around the world that are running the applications at like 1.4 gigahertz instead of four gigahertz because uh, someone is updating their drivers, like graphics drivers or uh, power options in Windows, and uh, it's, it's open to, to uh, really low performance in Java. Uh, and it's been going on for a long time. Uh, right now, I don't have th these problems in my desktop and computer, but it, it exists. It's about the uh, CPU scheduler 
and the power utilization of Windows. It, it's, it doesn't happen in Linux. Perception doesn't use synchronization, which means that it's, uh, we, uh, we do not use a synchronized keyword to synchronize any elements of, of the cal calculation. In, in this way, we accomplish 30% uh, greater speed. So um, how does perception work? Um, perception uh, operates uh, with integer numbers arranged in tables. All the tables possess the same format. Uh, this is the table one. In essence, it's a coordinate system. Each element is a number pair or a, co or a coordinate no number, also known as a complex number. So uh, if you're a mathematician, you will know uh, that, uh, that you can write it down like this. Uh, this is the matrix notation. And notice that the in indexes are uh, designed for mathematicians while programmers use, use different indexes. So here would be Z00 and not Z11. So um, the table 2 is of fundamental importance. It is uh, the table that contains pre-calculated values of complex function f of Z, where Z is taken from the table 1. The, which contains the coordinate system that we wish to uh, use to uh, draw fractals and other things. So, for example, if f of z, of z is the inverse of z, which means uh, this, then we take uh, each point from table 1 and calculate z, z new once, store it in the lookup table, and never calculate it again until we change the map or equation. Table 3 is the gradient. It is a simplified image with reduced data content. It's just black and white from 0 to 255 shades of gray from black to white. Um, and the table 4, which is about to appear, is the bailout matrix. The notation seems complicated, but it is uh, essentially a table that stores information whether the given a value in the lookup table is very big or very small. If it's bigger than the limit circle that fits within the screen, then we say, oh, this is bigger. But if it's smaller, then we say, oh, it's smaller. So we know for each value z from the lookup table whether it is beyond the limit of a circle that we um, define. Tables that contain pixels are images, and we have two of those, the screen and the temporary screen, or the buffer. Uh, so all, the ta all tables that contain pixels are images. By pixel, we mean color, and color is stored as integer number. For example, if this is the integer number, uh, it is divided into three sections. Each section denotes the value of the color, red, green, or blue. I think so. Uh, you need to know these things uh, if you want to program graphics. You need to use integer numbers because it's fast and it's it's uh, built into the Java language. All tables possess the same format. They're squares, okay? They're, they're the simplest to work with. But for speed purposes, each table is stored as a single long array. So you cannot have a two-dimensional table. You need to have a a very long array for speed purposes, and then work everything like that. So this is the most uh, intriguing and the most complex uh, uh, slide that you will see today. Uh, this is the perception algorithm. Uh, it, uh, it stems from the video feedback cycle, as we have seen examples uh, that use uh, camera and uh, TV screen. So we have the screen here. And we have the buffer, or the temporary screen. And all the visual flow goes from the screen to the buffer and back. And in between, there is a transformation going. So if we start uh, uh, by uh, opening, the c opening the first pixel of the buffer screen, we say, oh, what are we going to put here? We are going to put the color that we find at the screen. But where? At the location denoted by a uh, value z new, which is stored in the lookup table at the same 
index location as the buffer index that we are trying to fill in. So uh, we read the same index position in lookup table, bailout matrix, and gradient. So all these tables are read and written in coordination. Uh, we apply a single index, and the single index is uh, where, uh, and the same index is uh, where we find the value that goes into the equation. Uh, and then we read the color from the screen. So we write this to the same index position in the buffer as, let's see how it goes. At the location Z new at the screen, we read the pixel from the screen. And we, we, we read this value Z new, it's a fixed value uh, from the lookup table. If the Z new location is within the limit circle, we color invert pixel found there, which means that we switch from red to blue or perhaps from white to black or from black to white. Otherwise, if Z new is outside of the limit circle, we mix its color with the color of the gradient and it becomes mixed. We dress the image found at the screen in the image of the gradient and color invert it. If Z new location is beyond the screen's edge, we use linear transformation to contract Z new location and read pixel data nonetheless. Uh, so the linear transformation refers to this here. If the Z new location refers to uh, something that is beyond our uh, memory size, the size of the screen, we use some silly transformation to reduce, use, or contract that number and read the information from the screen nonetheless. So we get a lot of copies within copies within copies of everything found at the screen. It becomes so complicated that it is silly. Once I went to the college to discuss this with, a, with an expert in differential equations and chaos theory and we could not discuss it even though he is an expert and I made the program. So. Uh, it's not like I invented really these shapes. They simply appear naturally. Um, all the complex shapes and fractals that we see in Perceptron. Um, so let's move on to some more analysis. Uh, this is the similarity between Perceptron and the classical video feedback. It's basically, uh, classical video feed feedback has this sort of image within image within image appearance. And Perceptron has contours within contours within contours that are circular. Um, and the reason why they're interchanging colors is because in each iteration, we color invert everything that was found at the screen. So it's flickering all the time and also uh, this is the generation one, this is generation two, this is generation three, four, five. So depending from the frame rate you have this sort of age of fractal uh, as you go inwardly. Uh, it's more aged. Here we see uh, different uh, uh, presence of different transformations. This is the map Z in the first row this is the, not the, the, the transformation Z, and these are the linear transformations emphasized that show the contraction of the off-screen point back to the screen surface, uh, uh, which generates this sort of uh, fractal structure. And here, and here, in the second row, we have the map Z squared, which is non-linear. It is the source of Julia fractals. Uh, this is Z squared, this is Z on the fourth degree, and this is again Z squared. Um, so these are the type of uh, graphs that Perceptron is generating. Uh, you can in insert color, but these black and white images are important from artistic standpoint and uh, for analysis. And these, this is a slightly different uh, case study. Here we load a fixed image and transform it uh, without adding the um, interchanging contours in two opponent colors. And we apply different uh, uh, 
bailout or boundary conditions. So here we have the limit circle, but and here, but here we have a limit to rectangle and the limit something else and limit uh, again something else. So some other shapes are used as limit uh, uh, conditions uh, uh, to to generate uh, uh, the bailout matrix table. Um, my comfort has been uh, slightly reduced here uh, <laughs> over uh, the, 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 the intricacies of the um, presentation. So, optimization possibilities. Uh, always look for experienced people or otherwise you will die. Um, die alone and you will never realize your uh, dreams. Um, look for program examples, uh, go to college, uh, take somebody else's homework because if there weren't for the Michael Rule who was a student somewhere in the USA and who had a homework, I would never learn uh, uh, about uh, uh, this sort of programming. It gave me a reason to begin to work and it gave me really meaning of life because I've been uh, a developer for a number of years and I know how to build really interesting graphics applications now because I started working, I began my work with somebody's homework. Learn better programming. Uh, I have maybe uh, 100 gigabytes of books and they're all uh, mostly poor quality, we cannot afford them, so beware, maybe you won't have e enough books. This one is pretty good, uh, Herbert Schild, it is available for sale in Serbia in Novi Sad. Um, use bitwise operations, uh, see Hacker's Delight, it's a famous book that uses, uh, that exemplifies in C language how you uh, optimize uh, calculations such as multiplications, divisions, and such things. It is extremely complicated, but uh, so you have to use it as a reference constantly. And it, it is the same language used in C, C++, and Java. Uh, OpenCL, not OpenGL, but OpenCL is a new technology for AMD graphics acceleration. So hardware acceleration is available in Java. Google for Upper API. Uh, it has a, a five pages long instruction manuals uh, and it may allow or it may not allow for uh, uh, speed ups because basic Java is still very fast but if it does optimize something you may get for example five times greater uh, frame rate. Uh, Java 8 lambdas with parallel processing are now available and uh, they are I'm not so sure that they are a uh, good thing. And the new work stealing pool, uh, executor service that runs different processes and threads uh, on CPU is available, uh, which uh, uses, utilizes uh, multi-core CPUs. Uh, I will show you two more things. I will have to hurry up, so you will forgive me. How will you learn the chaos theory uh, well, first of all, Complexity Explorer is a website that offers free courses from the Santa Fe Institute. You should uh, make sure that you uh, apply for those courses. They're uh, out now. You should uh, perhaps try Chaos and Fractals, uh, a book uh, that is uh, very, very, uh, very suitable for all ages. Uh, you should uh, look for some pirated books or else there will be no books to read. Uh, Bookfinder.org uh, is the largest underground uh, library um, for these purposes. So uh, while they exist, uh, you should try to uh, study from them. Graphics programming language processing is a very interesting in net logo simulation environment. So uh, these slides will be made available to you at a later uh, a date, uh, uh, so you will be able to check all these things slowly. Uh, I'm now going to leave this uh, full screen and I'm going to go back here. Um. <laughs> I'm going to try to explain to you what is going on here. I have a direct connection to my desktop computer. Um, I cannot bring my desktop computer, it does not have a box. Uh, it's uh, uh, sort of uh, really weird. 
<laughs> and this is the development uh, version of Perceptron. Uh, it runs on Java 8, and Java 8 is not available on this desktop computer. So we have to run it on some more uh, advanced modern system. Otherwise, it looks exactly the same in Linux. But uh, my home Linux would be necessary. Um, this is, again, I will repeat a little bit slow and uh, ugly because it's, uh, it's uh, through an internet uh, broadcasting system uh, called TeamViewer. Um, so let's see, do we have here some kind of a control over this thing? Uh, I forgot really how to use it. Uh, just kidding. Okay, so this is the de the default perceptron. Uh, this is uh, to the uh, left side is the grabber window, which can grab live streams. And here we have options. There are uh, perhaps uh, I don't know how many options. We we spent all the all the keys on the keyboard, and we're still adding all options. So there are really. Uh, uh, tens of different options, maybe maybe up to a hundred options, or more. Um, and uh, this this is the 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 the, the signal that uh, as it is traveling through the internet, uh, with some delays, it's preventing me to perhaps establish a full control. But so. Um, Anyhow, you will have to uh, download the release candidate version from the SourceForge and run it on your computer. You, you will need the Java 8 uh, runtime environment. Uh, so I just want to uh, make a brief resume. Uh, what I told you today is that uh, we live in a new age. People do not believe anymore that science is uh, deterministic or that nature is deterministic. Nature is unpredictable and chaotic. Chaos theory is going to be our presence and future. Uh, you can try to study it at the complexityexplorer.org. Um, and uh, deterministic systems are capable of producing uh, endless variety, novelty, beauty, and other amazing uh, things that we see around, it's co chaos is the source of novelty and beauty in nature. Uh, here we had a program called Perceptron, uh, uh, which uh, displays video feedback fractals. They are both ordered and disordered, chaotic and beautiful. So if I may take your questions, if any, now. Any questions? Um, I have one question about the, uh, the integer math. So integer math? Yeah, you, you, you outlined that you're storing color information as a series of integer numbers with RGB sections. Yes. Splice it into those big numbers. Yes. Operations of RGB uh, instead of treating it as a hexadecimal. Uh, well, you see, um, the RGB uh, color space or color strategy is an, an invention of uh, old, uh, intelligent, brilliant in engineers who used machine programming, assembler, C language. And they knew that the CPU works best when it's when it works with integer numbers as uh, written in uh, binary format. So it's a bunch of uh, zeros and ones, 32 digits in total. And the CPU works best if it manipulates bits. Tell it to change a bit or two bits, first bit, last bit, 10 bits, change ones to zeros or zeros to ones, it's meaningless. You don't get anything intelligent in that way. But these are the, the technically speaking, fastest operations that you can perform on a computer. So in their best interest was to define 
all mathematical operations such as um, um, such as multiplication, division, or anything else, um, by using uh, bitwise operations, bitwise operations, and you need those operations as well to uh, uh, to to isolate the middle third of an integer, the last portion of the integer, or the first portion of the integer, and the logic in the program. Uh, uh, that uh, the the program itself, the part of the program that works with colors, is completely unreadable. It is unspeakably complicated to the naked eye. Uh, it it basically has to come from uh, re uh, experts. So those basic graphics uh, operations on color using color and pixel interpolation, pixel smoothening, because pixels are square, and if you have a chaos, you will have squares that explode into consequences. Everything would be terrible if we had square pixels. So you have to use interpolation, rounding, softening of image. You need to be an expert with color and color filters or else you will get an explosion of chaos. Uh, uh, it will look like noise. Uh, so um, uh, they uh, they are fast when they are integers. If you're using floating point uh, numbers, they don't really exist in a computer. Uh, they are concepts that uh, need to be uh, improved algorithmically. So if if you conceptualize, oh, let's have some gigantic numbers. No, you don't have a room for gigantic number. You have a room for 64 digits in a 64-bit proce processor, so it's a little bit uh, uh, different with the other than integer numbers, and you uh, cannot use really the, um, uh, the, the slow math in any way. If you use floating point numbers or anything else out of this scenario, it becomes too slow. But if you use this scenario, it is as fast as C or C++ program. So it's worthwhile programming in Java. Any, anyone else? <laughs> Something about chaos? About programming? Something about uh, Windows? You probably hate Windows. Yes! <laughs> Uh, k k k how do I handle what? How do you handle uh, graphics in a That's uh, Well, here's the deal. Uh, in Java, uh, there is no need for garbage collection. Basically, a garbage collector is some uh, kind of uh, process that runs on its own, and you never use it. We have, for example, graph graphics 2D object um, method called dispose. So if you have a graphics 2D object called object, uh, you type a point, dispose, and you can evoke it and use it. And if you don't use it, it still works. So I'm not using it. I'm uh, cheating, you know? Uh, I don't want to execute any, uh, uh, anything that would slow it down. But it does not slow it down. You can call this method dispose on almost any object when you need it disposed. But I don't need to dispose of uh, anything, uh, anything uh, during operation. It's all pretty, pretty efficient. Uh, it's a very good question. I went to a job conversation where they asked me this question. I was refused, and perhaps I do not know the answer to that question. But uh, I, uh, the only time I had problem with m the memory was when I designed the uh, preview, the pre the image preview uh, uh, method. What is it? When we load an external image, 
I wanted to bring up uh, uh, to bring up uh, this sort of uh, um, menu and to give me small icons, thumbnails. And I uh, wrote my own thumbnail generator. And when it loads like a hundred images, they're gigantic. Then it would run into a memory problem. But I solved this by choosing the proper kind of queue that uh, does not allow uh, a, a simultaneous loading of many images. So you cannot afford to load many hundreds of images where each image is 10 megabytes or more. Then it will create a memory problem. You have to use queues. It's a topic uh, 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 of um, how, how, how some images sit and wait to be loaded instead of being loaded at, at, at once. So you record their names or something and wait, for, wait to load them at the very last second when you need them. But otherwise, all other images, all other displays are very, very conservative. Uh, it, we have plenty of memory more. Um, yes, any, any, anyone else? Do -do 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 -do. <laughs> this is being recorded. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,